in session. The trial for Michael Jackson's doctor is in the final stage here. Is there going to be a verdict today? We're going to find out. I'm Christy Paul. Criminal defense attorney and former FBI intelligence analyst Keith Murray is with me. If you watched the closing arguments yesterday, you probably have a lot of questions about what was going on. Uh, Keith's going to help us walk through that. Hi, Keith. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good, thank you. I want to listen to some sound here, first of all, from uh, Mr. Walgren during closing arguments. And, and he raised some eyebrows when he used a specific term regarding how we should or should not trust the science in this case. What you were presented from Dr. White was junk science. It was disappointing. Dr. Schaefer said it was disappointing. It was garbage science. And it's sad that Dr. White came in here for whatever motive he may have had, whether there are financial considerations that he did not share, we don't know. But the foundation of trust between a patient and doctor, that theme extends to the ability to trust science. Keith, he pulled a bias. He pulled out the junk I science was just thing. That. Yeah. Well, and not only that, yep. but remember, three of the jurors who are sitting here uh, or there admit that they watched the Casey Anthony trial. And in that trial, we understood the whole junk science thing. They were introducing new science that had never been introduced in a case in Florida like that before in Casey Anthony. Do you think that that term junk science does, I is it applicable in this case? Um, it's certainly echoing from what we've seen over the summer. I think here what we have is a battle of the experts, and you had one expert, Schaefer, who was running all these computer simulations, and uh, the defense got up there and said, well, it's over the top. He ran too many. He, he ran things to make it fit certain facts, but there were certain simulations that he ran that had nothing to do with the facts of this case. So he kind of went over the top and a little too far. But then you have White who came on and said, well, you know, I don't know how they ran this particular study, and I don't know about the particular facts of this. So you had the other one looking kind of deficient, um, but admitting that he didn't know everything about what he was talking about, even though he's still an expert in propofol. He didn't know about, you know, specific tests and studies that were done. So the jury's going to have to sit there and balance whether or not they want to go with the guy who's over the top and did a whole bunch of simulations that may or may not have been relevant to the case to the guy who knows a good bit about it but admits that he doesn't know everything. I think it's going to be more of a character well, issue. Well, not only that, around. but a guy, meaning Paul White, who uh, also had to concede an awful lot of negligence uh, in this case as well. And, and at the end of the day, it comes down to whether that negligence equates to a criminal act. So, you know, Chernoff, right. also one of the things that he took issue with was uh, Alberto Alvarez and his testimony about helping Conrad Murray hide the vials and, and some things perhaps that uh, weren't found uh, as evidence. Would, do you think in this case there was enough evidence to help the prosecution prove its burden? I think well, what the, the attack the prosecution took, and they basically covered all their bases, was what, what the doctor was doing from the outset was negligent. What the defense did was concede negligence, but say there's an intervening factor, which was Jackson dosed himself, either with lorazepam or propofol. Mm -hmm. Then the state's other part of their theory is, well, even if Jackson did dose himself and it was an intervening factor, it's still negligence because the doctor walked away and he should have been there monitor monitoring Jackson you know, every minute, every second that he was giving him these drugs. So the defense really locked down not just the, the negligence aspect in the overall circumstance of giving Jackson a surgical anesthetic in a completely improper setting, but they also locked it down with the defense's theory of Jackson self-dosing by Murray walking away, talking on his cell phone, going to the bathroom. So, you know, the defense has a really tough burden to get over here in overcoming, not that they have the burden of proof, the technical term, but in mm -hmm. overcoming the, what the state has put out there in terms of the overall you know, specific negligence of those two different aspects. Let's go over causation here for a second. Uh, according to the jury instructions, the jury has to believe that Conrad Murray caused Michael Jackson's death either directly, uh, that he was a substantial cause, and that he wasn't necessarily the only cause, but I, it sounds like the only thing that would absolve him would be if there was this intervening act. And as the defense says, this intervening act was Michael Jackson uh, pushing the button, so to speak. There, here's where it gets tricky, that it, 
it's only an intervening act if it's an unforeseeable act. When you look at these instructions, is there any way that Conrad Murray can walk away from this unscathed? Right, well, and the, and the unforeseeable act that they're talking about is Jackson, whether or not Jackson did or did not dose himself. Mm -hmm. The state's saying Jackson knew how to use propofol. He was very well educated in it. He's been using it for some time. He knew how to do a minister. He knew to mix it with lidocaine so it wouldn't burn. He knew how to push it himself. Um, so the state is sitting there saying this was entirely foreseen because Jackson knew what he was doing. He wanted it that badly. The defense is saying, you know, Jackson's lying there on the bed. He's not in a condition to do this. Even if Murray walked away, um, you know, it wasn't foreseen. But that Jackson may have taken lorazepam orally in his own bathroom. Um, so, again, we're at this, this, this is a tricky one because the language is very complex, not mm -hmm. just the three elements that need to be proven, but the sub-elements you know, of causation. Uh, the jury, it, hopefully the jury takes the time and really gets analytical with this. They don't come back in an hour with a verdict, which is kind of going to be shooting from the hip. I, I see this jury taking um, several days and going through these things point by point to make sure that the state did prove its burden. Well, let me ask you this then. If you see this going several days, uh, it's Friday. So this jury, if they don't have a decision today, will go th home for the weekend. If you have that interruption of two days, what does that do to the process of, of deliberating? I mean, now you, you've lost some of your momentum and you're talking about a jury who's not sequestered. So even though, you know, right. you put your trust in them that they're not going to watch the news and listen to the analysts, <laughs> which everybody's talking about this. Now, I, I have a three-day weekend theory where if a jury goes away for the weekend on vacation, they come back that Tuesday morning, they convict. And I've had this happen. Um, really? So, you know, you, you, yeah, you do. It's, it's, I don't know. There are no statistics about it, but I've had it happen to me. Um, so we kind of put that out there. But you let them go home for the jury. They start thinking independent or go home for the weekend. They start thinking independently exactly. and not part as a group and not discussing, and they tend to make up their minds. So when they come back on Tuesday, um, it's going to be, you know, tougher to overcome and tougher to talk together as a group. And, but in cases like this, a lot of times, criminal cases, they tend to come back of the same mind. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm always very wary of, of, you know, juries going home for the weekend when they haven't reached a verdict. All righty. Keith Murray, thank you so much for your insight, as always. It's good to have you here today. Sure. Sure. Attorneys finished their closing arguments yesterday, as you know. So the moment jurors get to court today, the deliberation begins. Let's check out some of the defense's final words to those jurors.